everyone welcome to our bioethics and law seminar and um my name is Oren Asman I'm uh, the co-director of the uh, center and we'll be moderating uh today's event the bioethics and law center in the Tel Aviv uh, University Faculty of Medicine aims to advance interprofessional collaboration and education in uh, bioethics health law and the medical humanities. We strive to include health professionals, scientists, policymakers, uh, students, and the general public in the bioethics and healthcare policy deliberation. We do so through seminars, workshops, conferences, and work groups. Our seminar today is an example of a truly interprofessional, cross faculty, and international platform for ethical deliberation. And we look, for, for look forward to the uh, discussion. Our center's goal is to further develop and support and strengthen the ethics program in preclinical studies and in teaching hospitals. Our next in-person event uh, will be held in the Geha Mental Health Center on May 1st. And more information on this and other events will be available on our website and social media outlets. Uh, also, international students and faculty who are interested in visiting us and possibly taking part in research projects are encouraged to reach out and explore this possibility. Uh, you may send an email or direct message uh, Amir Tal, Yechiel Barilan, or myself. Um, before we begin today's seminar, I'm, I'm happy to give the floor to Professor Karen Avraham, Dean of the Tel Aviv University Faculty of Medicine. Uh, please. Thank you, Dr. Osman Oren. Thank you for inviting me to say a few words in the beginning. So it's really been wonderful to see um, the, the increase in uh, activity in this area. And I think it really attests to the fact that it's become clear to all of us the critical place that AI is going to have in all of our lives. Of course, we know of the most recent revolution, and, and there's a lot of buzz and a lot of talk about, about where it's going to take us and what the implications are, um, what the, the positive sides of it, what are the potential dangers. And it's really wonderful to see that you've decided to take this upon yourself and address these issues. I think it's no accident that when there was the Human Genome Project that a significant portion, or at least relative to the cost of sequencing and all those other highly expensive uh, technology that came about then, that there was a significant portion of the Human Genome Project that was put into studying the ethical, social, and legal issues of what was being done in the, in the genome. And so it's I think that that really gave a very good platform to being aware that discussing the implications in our in these kinds of forums and where it's going to take us in terms of society is so critical. So I want to again congratulate you on the series that you're putting together. Have a successful meeting when you visit Gaia. I was there for their 60th anniversary. Uh, really a remarkable place, looking also for a lot of growth. And so I know that you'll be able to contribute there as well. And uh, wishing everyone uh, a wonderful and peaceful and enjoyable holiday. Thank you very much, and thank you for your ongoing support of our activities. Um, so let's uh, begin our seminar. So, you know, conceptually, I think um, conversational artificial intelligence is probably could be traced back to the uh, 50s of, of the prior century. Um, but practically, it became globally accessible to anyone with an internet connection uh, probably on November 2022. This also led to a very lively public discourse about what this could mean for the future of various human activities and professions. We now hear about the search for the Holy Grail and artificial general intelligence. And while we're probably still, still far from what we may see in the movies, at least the movies that I choose to see, it seems that we're a lot closer than we were maybe a decade ago. In the field of healthcare, artificial intelligence can augment healthcare providers' abilities. 
it brings an amazing promise, which can be soon read about in the new book by Peter Lee and Carrie Goldberg and Isaac Cohen, uh, titled The AI Revolution in Medicine, GPT-4 and Beyond. It's coming out on May 3rd, and it, it seems like a very promising book. And, you know, as expected, these capabilities come with many issues of concern, such as fairness and privacy issues, transparency, trustworthiness, harm reduction, uh, intellectual property issues, and so on. So, you know, to delve, delve deeper into some of these issues, we have decided to hold this series of uh, seminars. I'd like to extend my warm gratitude to Dr. Amir Tal, who coordinates this seminar and connects uh, people and professionals so well in doing so. And to uh, Professor Echiel Barilan, uh, my uh, partner in directing the center, and any, uh, any of the other members of our Bioethics and Law Center uh, who are very much helpful with uh, making things happen for us. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, today's main speaker. Jana Sedlakova is writing her PhD in the Institute of Biomedical Ethics and the History of Medicine in the Medical Faculty of the University of Zurich. Her first uh, PhD article, as far as I know, was published in the American Journal of Bioethics, and it's called Conversational Artificial Intelligence in Psychotherapy, a New Tool or Agent? And it's a wonderful article. It immediately led us to contact her, and uh, I was really excited to hear that she is willing to present here in our uh, seminar. And I'm very much looking forward to hear what you have uh, to say, Jana. So really, the floor is yours. And uh, you can also share your screen. And looking forward to hearing you. Also, you, people, uh, you are invited people to uh, consider opening up your cameras. Just uh, allows the discussion to be more friendly uh, and, and human-like. Uh, there you go. Please. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the very kind invitation and introduction. Uh, I will share my screen. <clears throat> so as already introduced, I will mainly talk about the um, my first PhD paper uh, where I discussed the conversational artificial intelligence in the psychotherapeutic landscape. And we discussed the question if this technology is a tool or an agent. But in today's presentation, I would like also to go a little bit beyond this paper and ask uh, other questions that I'm asking myself recently. And this, when does a simulation of human-like features make sense? Uh, so maybe I will start first a little bit uh, uh, to introduce myself. So as already mentioned, I'm a PhD researcher at the Institute of Biomedical Ethics and History of Medicine. I'm also a PhD researcher at the Digital Society Initiative in the University of Zurich that focuses very much on interdisciplinary research. Um, I'm also a manager of two scientific communities of this Digital Society Initiative, and I'm also affiliated with the Institute for Implementation Science in Healthcare, where I mainly collaborate with health researchers. And my interest is mainly in the ethics of artificial intelligence, philosophy of psychiatry, philosophy of technology and epistemology. I studied uh, philosophy, but now I collaborate uh, with many researchers from different backgrounds. As already mentioned, health research, computer science and, and ethics mainly, but also others. So this is the overview of my today's presentation. I will start with some background information about the conversational artificial intelligence. Then I will introduce the, uh, the main question that we addressed in the age of paper. Then I will uh, comment something on, on the concept of agency because particularly after receiving commentaries about this paper, I realized that this concept of agency is quite complicated and I would like to, to spend some time there. And, and then also related to agency, I would like to talk more specifically about the normative perspective and epistemic perspective. And then I would like to reformulate the, the ethical challenge slightly. And finally, I would like to introduce an, a preliminary ethical framework that I've worked now currently. And of course, some conclusions at the end. 
So the background, what is the conversational artificial intelligence in the psychotherapeutic landscape? Uh, so to put it very simply, these are chatbots uh, that use either text or voice messages. They are based very often on AI and interact with users or patients to provide them with mental health support by applying evidence-based methods. And this is very often cognitive behavioral therapy. And in this paper, and also in my research, I focus only on conversational AI that uses evidence-based methods. There are, of course, many different chatbots and conversation agents that are not based on these uh, evidence-based methods, but I'm not focusing on them. And what is at the core of this technology is, of course, communication. And this communication should be human-like, or at least this is the goal of the design. So there is a very strong simulation of human interaction in the way how these chatbots interact with patients and with users. So this represents an important digital transformation, not only in psychotherapy, but also in communication as such. It's basically the first time when we don't use technology for communication purposes, but we communicate with the technology. And what is, of course, important is to make sure that this technology and this digital shift or this digital transformation is actually beneficial uh, for users or patients' well-being and empowerment. And this is even more important in the psychotherapeutic landscape. Uh, I want also to, to mention the main benefits and the roles of conversational AI. So the one that is very often mentioned and is also very important is its potential to bridge the treatment gap. And it's because it's free accessible. Um, there is also a lower risk, risk of stigmatization because people feel um, that they will not be judged. And uh, this technology has also a big potential to be complementary to therapy, to support patients in between sessions, and to provide them with real-time interventions. So for example, if a patient has an anxiety attack, they can use the, the conversational AI and it's the, the support is immediately there. Uh, then it's also very important in prevention and education. This technology can provide evidence-based information in a more accessible way, uh, for example, by using some gamification aspects and also, of course, in a more interactive way, uh, which might be much more effective than just reading on the website some information. And it also can, can teach uh, people important skills and techniques how to deal with uh, their mental health problems or how to improve their mental health and well-being. And finally, uh, this technology can be also important to collect data because this technology can collect data in a natural environment and again in the real time. And this can potentially improve on the understanding of, of risk factors and understand the mental illness and, and provide some personalized treatment. So these are the, the potentials um, and the benefits of this um, technology. So the question is, how does technology interact? Uh, I have here one specific example from Wobot that was developed by in Stanford. And this technology usually teach uh, users and patients specific techniques and skills. Uh, for example, uh, based on cognitive behavioral therapy, it can uh, teach patients to recognize uh, their distortive thoughts. So for example, black and white thinking. And then this technology teach them to, to reformulate them in a more uh, healthy way. It also helps uh, patients to recognize patterns in their thoughts, moods, and behaviors. So for example, this robot can notice that every Sunday evening, uh, a person feels sad and depressed. And what I want to focus here on is that this technology, as we can see here in this example, is developed with these very strong human-like features. Very often, this technology plays a role of a social companion and it offers emotional support. For example, uh, we have here these empathetic statements, gosh, that's really tough, or I'm really proud of you. It also encourages uh, patients, for example, I want to let you know that you will begin to feel better again. So we can see that the way how this technology interacts is, is very like, like another human being. 
And one of the goals of this uh, human-like feature is to establish a therapeutic alliance uh, with users and patients. When we look into the research on this technology, there are some studies that show effectiveness, but they are still not conclusive, uh, mainly because the, uh, the group is very small, uh, usually students, and, and the studies uh, were quite uh, short term. When we look into the ethics, uh, usually the ethical issues of AR are in this broader context of privacy and data protection, which are of course very important, but what is still missing is the focus on the aspects of human AI interaction and on the way how these chatbots interact and what role they should have in interaction and in the therapeutic process. And also there is not enough research that would um, uh, inquire about users' experiences and opinions with this technology. And uh, there was a recent study in 2021 uh, by Darcy et al. That, uh, and this study shows some evidence that robot uh, is able to form therapeutic alliance uh, with patients. And as you can see here, uh, robot, this is the yellow uh, dots, had similar score to human um, therapist. And patients or users uh, scored very high the following sentences. I believe Robot likes me, Robot and I respect each other. And there are some problematic aspects of this study. I will not comment uh, too much about it. One thing is that the study was, uh, was done by researchers that actually developed the robot. So there is, of course, the question of conflict of interest. Uh, but what is important for me now is that it's very problematic um, to have this technology with these strong human-like features and take it for granted. And also the strong simulation of human-human interaction in psychotherapy and this goal of actually creating therapeutic alliances is problematic. And this is a claim uh, that I will argue for during my entire presentation. So why is it problematic? Now, I want to introduce the main ethical challenge that we formulated in the age of paper. And this is the question, if this technology is a tool or an agent. And it looks like that it can be both because on the one hand, it's a tool. It's, it's just a software developed for some purposes. And traditionally, we wouldn't say that this technology can have responsibility. It's not a human being. And traditionally, in ethics and, and philosophy, it's only humans that are able to have responsibility for several reasons. But then on the other hand, it seems to be also an agent, also in the way how this technology is described for the marketing purposes, is that it's a digital therapist. So there is this very strong tendency to develop this technology with the human-like features such as empathy and humor, and it is actually experienced as an agent. And this is not only because the social response theory that people tend to, to react and experience computer as agents, uh, but it is because of the design. So this technology is developed in a way so that it experiences another agent. And this is an important distinction or an important question to ask because a good tool means something different than a good agent. So depending on where on this uh, continuum the technology is, different normative requirements are there. And we look, when we look in the interaction and in the interaction style, um, it seems like the conversational AR is more on the spectrum of an agent because of the strong human-like features. It is actually a partner in a conversation, so we converse with the technology, and there is this goal of therapeutic alliance. Of course, there are still some important shortcomings. It's not a, we cannot say that it's exactly like a human agent. Uh, this technology lacks complexity. It can be often repetitive and task-oriented. So it's not yet possible to have such a level of, uh, of complex conversation as is the case with hum another human agent. And again, as I mentioned, there is this very strong trend in development that this technology is perceived as an agent. So basically, the, the aim is that it passes the Turing test. 
But when we look into the ethics, very often uh, the ethical requirements are, are linked with safety and privacy. So it suggests more that is on the side on the tool. So I, we see there a discrepancy between the interaction and, and the ethics. And we claim that these human-like features and the simulation of human-human uh, interaction needs uh, ethical requirements and normative uh, rules because Human therapies have, for example, code of contact. They have set of duties and responsibilities uh, that shape their interaction style. But this is not the case with uh, conversational AI, even though it simulates such a conversation and interaction. So the question is how conversational AI should interact. Uh, so I will continue with this concept of agency because after receiving these commentaries uh, on uh, the age of paper, uh, I realized that Basically, almost every single author of these commentaries used a different concept of agency. And it was one of the crucial concepts uh, that was important in these commentaries and in the further discussions about this, uh, this paper. And I found that the concept of agency is quite complex and it's almost like a labyrinth. And it's not so easy to, to orient ourselves there because there are so many different concepts across disciplines, we have different theories. And depending on what concepts uh, we use, there are different uh, consequences also in terms of, of ethics and normative requirements. But one important distinction that is there and is particularly crucial in, in this technology is that we need to distinguish between the perceived agency and the, so to speak, the real agency. But then the question is, of course, um, what importance or significance the perceived agency has in comparison to the real one. And I want to just to introduce you here just a few of the main theories and distinctions just to give you a little bit of taste how complex it is. And so we can distinguish between the intrinsic agency and the behavioral agency. So the interesting agency is when we look for specific properties that the entity has. And the approach of the behavioral agency looks more on the side how the entity actually behaves and what can be observed. Uh, then very traditionally, we can again talk about intentional agency or for example, mental states or will or reason responsiveness and understanding can play an important role. But then on the other hand, we can have more goal-oriented agency that is particularly used in the context of technology and uh, also in the context of AI. So for example, Russell and Norvig defined uh, the agency of artificial intelligence as a goal-oriented and as the ability to respond to the environment. So this is a very different uh, understanding of agency than the philosophical one, when we need to have mental states and intentions. Uh, then we have rational agency, particularly in the context of conversation, for example, or knowledge acquisition. And then again, the intentional, the traditional intentional uh, agency play an important role with the mental states and reason responsiveness. And of course, uh, here, uh, regarding the conversational AI, moral agency is crucial, and particularly regarding the question of responsibility. So where lies the responsibility? It is on the side of the, of the technology, is on the side of the therapist that uses technology, is it, it lies maybe even by the users or in the entire system and all the stakeholders that develop this technology. And we can have something like group agency, or we can look at the particular actors and their virtues and values. And traditionally, again, the rational agency and intentional agency are very crucial because traditionally we would say that a human being is a moral agent because it's able to recognize the reasons for the right actions. So we decide for an action that is correct or right, and we know why. But then what we can ask is if the moral agency is more important or more related to the actor or to the act as such. And this is again important considering the conversational AI because there we can say the, the entity of the conversational AI is not, not important. What is important is that the action of interaction is similar to humans. So maybe they are bearer of the moral responsibility. And again, when looking on the different commentaries, different author, authors 
uh, argued for the moral agency for the conversational AR or against it because they claim that this is only a tool and the moral agency is only prohibited. And what is interesting that uh, now, mainly given the context of artificial intelligence, a few authors start to conceptualize different levels of moral agency. Because as, as we can already see, this is quite a complex issue. So for example, more uh, distinguish between four different levels of moral agency. So the first level will be more functional moral agency when the artificial intelligence has only some moral consequences and it's important how it's designed and how it functions. Then there are implicit moral agents, explicit moral agents and full moral agents. I unfortunately can't go into detail into it, but uh, I found it very interesting approach to have this different level of moral agency, how to deal with the complexity of this issue. And Niholm also uh, similarly distinguishes between different levels of moral agency, but this strategy is more to look at the collaboration between the technology and uh, of humans that are involved. His typical example is, for example, autonomous cars. So our approach in, in, the, in the paper was to take the strongest possible uh, understanding and concept of, of agency by humans. And this was a conscious decision. We had the reasons for this. And the main reason to have this very strong understanding of agency and to compare the conversational AI to this agency was that the conversational AI has the goal of simulating human-human interaction. And this other reason was that we are in the psychotherapeutic landscape. So we are in the context where the moral agency and rational agency are crucial because Psychotherapy is, of course, embedded in the entire system of values and virtues. So in the paper, we would understand that the agency simply is the ability to act and such concepts as autonomy, intentionality and mental states are very important. As already mentioned, the moral agency is there, so therapists are bearer of responsibility, they have a set of virtues and values. And in terms of rational agency, um, we draw on the theory of uh, Robert Brandom, who is philosopher of pragmatism, and he defines rational agency as to be subject to a distinctive kind of norm normative appraisal assessment of the reason. And we chose this definition and concept of rational agency because there is already the normative aspect there. And this is quite important. So rationality is not normatively neutral. So this is the case by humans, but when we look at the uh, conversational AI, of course, we can say there that there is to some extent agency because they're autonomous, but they're autonomous in a different sense than humans. Uh, they are autonomous in the way that they can be self-directed and to some extent independent of the developers and other human beings. They have no intentionality in the traditional sense. They have, of course, no mental states. They have no responsibility, and if so, only in the limited functional sense, as Moore defines it, so they can fulfill the first level, maybe the second one. They have no understanding, and uh, here I would just uh, refer to John Searle, who claimed that computers have uh, syntax but no semantics, and I found it still non-controversial claim. So this was... Uh, the part about the different concepts of agency. And now I would like to proceed to the, and to look at the concept of agency more in the epistemic and uh, normative context. So here again, I would like to refer to the theory of pragmatism. And when we look into a conversation, the knowledge acquisition there is quite important. And Robert Brandom and Wilfried Sellers uh, define conversation as the normative and social game of giving and asking for reasons. And this is the, the aspects of the normativity and sociality are quite, quite crucial there. So when we are in an interaction and conversation with other, uh, with other people, uh, we have specific implicit and explicit rules. We know how we should talk to each other, how we should interact, how uh, we can convince someone else 
about what we believe. And there is, of course, the social aspect, how to behave to each other. And the aspects of giving and asking reasons is also important because when I'm claiming something like here today, I should be able to justify it. So I should be able to give you reasons for it. And we can say that people follow some inferential rules. So when I claim something, I can justify it. I know who is connected with this, uh, with this claim or what is excluded. I can provide some information, but this normative and social aspects are also important and they are intrinsic for conversation. So there are aspects of respect, of mutual acknowledgement, of authority and responsibility. And the responsibility is, for example, again, connected with the question of justification. But we have also different virtues and values as rational, moral, and social agents that are engaged in this complex um, process of conversation. But how does it look like when one of these agents is a chatbot, if it's a conversational AI? Can conversational AI participate? It's such a normative and social game of giving and asking for reasons. And here the situation is more complicated because it is there and it isn't there at the same time. <laughs> so we can say that AI is able to follow some inferential rules. It can maybe be even better because it can have a bigger uh, database. It can definitely provide more information and make some claims. But the la two last aspects that are mainly connected with this normative uh, and with the normativity and sociality are not there. Or at least it will be quite controversial to claim that they are there because they are not rational and moral agents. So to conclude, I would, I, I would like to claim that it's important to, to define novel ways of uh, interaction between conversational AI and humans and to define novel types of relationship. So the aim shouldn't be to, to establish a therapeutic alliance because these agents are not moral and racial no, agents. They're not like humans. So maybe instead of looking at the similarities between humans and conversational AI, it might make sense to look to be more creative and look at these novel ways of how this technology can interact and what frameworks can shape such an interaction relationship. And also regarding knowledge acquisition in the psychotherapy, this is even strengthened because a psychotherapist is very often a facil facilitator of self-knowledge and self-understanding. And here I draw on the theory of Stribos, who where we can distinguish between three types of, of knowledge. So first is the first person knowledge, where the therapist enables patients to learn something about themselves. So it's really like a mediator, or we can, in a more philosophical sense, we can talk, for example, about Socrates, who enable uh, people to learn something new only based on asking some questions. And then it's also important to think about the second person knowledge, where patients, uh, uh, when persons can learn something new, when patients can learn something new because the therapist is treating them, for example, in a compassionate and kind way. And like these patients can start to perceive this compassionate and kind way to themselves. And finally, there is this third person knowledge, which would be something like objective knowledge. So for example, the therapist can explain patients uh, different uh, theories how human mind and human behavior works. So this is uh, more objective and detached from this interpersonal and, and subjective aspects. And this complexity of, of the different kind of self-knowledge acquisition enables the therapeutic insight and therapeutic uh, change. And these are also the strong benefits uh, from therapeutic alliance. And here I again want to highlight that we are in the psychotherapeutic landscape and this entire conversation and interaction is embodied in the set of values and virtues. And um, these agents are responsible, social and non -hypnotic. But when we look at the conversational AI and the chatbots, of course, they can also facilitate some type of self-knowledge and knowledge. 
But this is more strongly on the side of the third person knowledge, so more on the side of quantified and factual information. Uh, I think it would be very problematic to say that there is second person knowledge because chatbots are not, um, they are not other human beings. Um, and the first person knowledge can be there definitely. One of the goals is to teach patients new skills and techniques, which can also lead to the self-knowledge. But this is also very limited. It's not as complex as with another human being. And this is also due to the way how the technology is developed. It can only predict how the conversation will go on. And this is quite uh, difficult, particularly in the psychotherapeutic context. And these chatbots again have more functional goals, for example, monitoring, or they have only a specific set of skills and techniques that you can teach. It will be very hard to develop a conversational AI that would be able to uh, switch between different um, therapies. Maybe it will be possible later on, but we are not there yet. So the therapeutic alliance is, is very problematic. The users and patients might be able to develop a relationship with this technology that might be beneficial, but to say that this is therapeutic alliance is problematic because the conditions that we see on the left side, but humans are not fulfilled. So there is no responsibility, no values and virtues. And we can even say that this technology can introduce a new kind of epistemic injustice because patients uh, and users might be restricted only to a certain kind of conversation and knowledge acquisition that is very much shaped by the abilities of the technology. Because the technology cannot understand all the context and all the elements of the, what the person is going on. So the person might limit uh, themselves to share only something that the chatbot will understand later. So now I would like to reformulate the, the first puzzle or the first ethical challenge in a different way. And um, when I received again these commentaries and and I saw how different we can define the agency and the different consequences that can be there. I started to think again about metaphysics or ontology after many years. <laughs> so now I will be a little bit more philosophical because um, asking what is actually conversational AI and what type of agent it is, is basically an ontological question. And I was just asking myself to what extent can these questions help us to shape the uh, the conversation and the relationships that we can have with the technology. And I think that the metaphysical this or the ontological uh, consideration cannot give us sufficient ground for normativity and for orientation. And it is because, for example, if the technology doesn't have properties of a moral and rational agents, but it simulates to have them, and it is actually perceived as if this technology had them, then these categories are not helpful because we would still treat the technology as a more unrational agent and it should still have the same impact on us. And we could say that maybe this is only an individual case when someone, for example, fall in love with the chat board or with the chat GPT-3 now. <laughs> but actually, this is, I would say this is a systematic problem because the simulation is at the core of this technology. And we can also see it in, in the societal um, discussion, particularly now after the chat GPT-3, the question is, what is actually this technology and how to use it? So. The main question that I'm asking now is how to define the value of such simulation. What is the value of the simulation of human-human interaction? And what norms should shape uh, the interaction between conversational AR and humans and relationships? And now to conclude, um, I'm still working on this question, so I'm sorry that I cannot give you a full answer, but I think this will be work for many years. <laughs> and I try to develop a preliminary ethical framework, how to think about the simulation of these human-like features. So this is the preliminary assessment workflow. And this is the way how I think it's, it's meaningful to think about it. And it's based on the claim that when you have possibilities, they should be also always linked with the responsibilities. So we very often say that we can do something 
Uh, but if we can do something, there is always the question of what we should do with it. So the normativity is always there. And so this is the, the workflow. So if you have a simulation of a, a feature of a human-like feature, for example, humor, it would make sense to think first about the strengths and the limits that they're linked to the specific purpose or function of this feature. And then it makes sense to ask, okay, what would be expectations from the side of users and patients if we have the simulation of feature? For example, in the case of humor, we would probably like to reach um, a lighter atmosphere or that the user can laugh and, and uh, a slight change in the mood maybe. So if this can be fulfilled, then it makes sense to continue. And if it doesn't kind of be fulfilled, we should evaluate the risks when these expectations are not uh, fulfilled and maybe think about new purposes and new functions of this simulated feature. But if it can be then fulfilled, we can think about the responsibilities that are connected with this and the normative conditions. So for example, in the case of humor, uh, the chatbot should be sensitive to the personal um, situation of the person so that uh, the person doesn't feel to be insulted or harmed in a way. So if these uh, responsibilities or conditions can be filled, fulfilled, then it's perfect. This makes sense. But if it cannot be, again, we need to evaluate the risks and ask about new rules and normative conditions that will make sense. So I would be very curious to hear from you what you think about this, because this is quite new. <laughs> this is still work in progress. And finally, I would like to conclude. I have a few conclusions. So we started with this continuum. Where is the AI? It's a tool, it's an agent, it's a digital therapist or an agent. I think this in the end, two sides of one coin, it's, it's one and the other. And it's mainly one and the other because of this very strong simulation of human-human interaction. And it's very important to, to be more creative there and to start to think about novel forms and rules of this interaction and acknowledging both the strengths and the limits. There is also important to have clearer understanding about limits of the technology and the responsibilities and normative requirements. We definitely need more research uh, regarding this interaction styles. The very important question is, for example, what social role this uh, conversational AI should have, because it can, for example, be a companion. It can pretend to be an expert. And actually, I'm currently developing an empirical study where we will develop six different chatbot personas with three different social roles. And we are interested in how patients will respond to them. Then from the side of the developers, uh, it would make sense to be clear in the communication about limits of this technology, what this technology can and cannot do, and what are the functions so that users have more clear expectations. And of course, there is needed more discussion and more understanding among users, public, and experts across disciplines. And through this, I would like to conclude and thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very much looking forward to your feedback and questions. Thank you very much uh, for this very uh, deep and uh, philosophically uh, enthusiastic, uh, amazing presentation. I think a lot of issues to discuss. Um, I wonder, you, you asked me to present a bit of what we did, but I think there were so many other commentaries. So maybe I'll I present it in like three or four minutes, uh, just some thoughts. It's not really the full text that we wrote. And then we'll open up for discussion because there's a lot to um, talk yeah. about. Oh, you're talking about our commentary? So I'm not going to present the whole commentary, but there's a part where I want you, Michael, perhaps to, to share your thoughts and then I'll, I'll open up for discussion. So... Um, so I, I got really excited with your paper and I, I got uh, my friends and colleagues excited with me. And then we uh, found ourselves writing this uh, commentary, which I don't know, at some point would probably be published. And we called it uh, Conversational Artificial Intelligence Patient Alliance. So instead of Doctor Patient Alliance or Therapist Patient Alliance, um, Robot Patient Alliance, uh, and, and whether or not uh, Turing test could be performed on that. And, and, and specifically what uh, I thought was really important is to, to focus on authenticity or as uh, at least one uh, a scholar wrote about it, he calls it uh, congruence. So uh, he, not necessarily representing my friends, but some thoughts that I had and, and we discussed together. So 
you know, we, we were, I think, referring not just to CBT, which I think you focused on, like specific, very well-defined, uh, 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 as you said, uh, based evidence-based uh, methodologies in psychotherapy. But we, I think we thought of psychotherapy in a more, like in a wider way, which includes a lot of different approaches. And uh, so you talk about uh, people who are professionals, they're trained uh, usually for several years, and then they go through supervision with another uh, trained professional and they're certified. And, you know, I was thinking, so how can we practically think about AI and how can we uh, create a professional AI that is trained, that is supervised, that is certified? And uh, theoretically, we can think about parallels if we have to, but then uh, my colleagues uh, stated that maybe we don't have to compare everything that is new to what we already have right? Uh, like the supervision could be a supervision by uh, a man in the loop or a person in the loop. It could be, you could have a new therapist born out of nothing because it's AI. You just copy what's already there. So it's it's really hard to compare a new professional to a new machine or a new software or whatever. Um, and, and, and what we wrote, and I think I really uh, think is key, is that when you talk about psychotherapy, there, there, there seems to be primacy to authenticity, even over utility, especially because a lot of people go to therapy, they're not necessarily knowing what it is that they're seeking for. It's not like I am coming to therapy, I want to fix this and that, and please fix this. It might be the case, and then they might over time realize that they actually have other issues that they're more interested in and concerned with. So it seems that the authenticity of the relationship is maybe uh, primary to any other goals, especially if it's uh, uh, if you go to analysis, then really the goal theoretically would be to further analyze, not necessarily in, in any specific goal. So something happens there. Um, now, you know, I was talking to a lot of therapists about this. Some were afraid of the concept of even considering calling this psychotherapy. They say you can call it whatever you want. This is not psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is among to human beings, so you can give it another name, but please don't even compare those two. And I was wondering why it made them feel so anxious. And I, I don't think it's because they're worried for their job. So I think it's something else. It's something that relates to the basis of the, the therapeutic relationship that they feel will never be the same if you look at a, a robot and a person. And so when you talk about congruence, it's basically, I talk to you and, I have this feeling that you're telling me what it is that you really think and you really feel. And while I can rely on the computer to not lie to me, perhaps, maybe, if it's planned like this, it's strange to think about it as someone who is genuine with their intentions, because it's strange to think about intentions of a language model. So, you know, so it's it's a little bit hard to apply what we know uh, about regular therapy. I, I see Michael thinking already. Yeah, Michael, what do you want to say, please? No, no, I will be brief. Thank you. Um, I thank you very much, uh, Yana, for the presentation. It's, you picked up a very difficult topic. Um, in the Buddhist tradition, there, there are prayer flags. I, I know what they are. I mean, they you write the prayer on the flag, and when the wind blows the flag, the prayer is said. You don't need uh, somebody to really recite the paper. Maybe it looks some of the Orthodox Jews when they do the prayer, it's quite automatic. <laughs> so, so, we don't know how psychotherapy works, if it works in many, many circumstances. So, Without clear knowledge what psychotherapy is on what school of psychotherapy we are dealing with, or by what measure, any evaluation of artificial intelligence in the field uh, would be quite impossible. Psychotherapy is a very broad term. Talking about Freudian analysis, does it work? Does it have any scientific basis? It has no evidence-based foundation whatsoever. So by what way can we train AI to do it or evaluate value? And it goes, I will not be too long, just a throw a thought. Suppose we prove that 
CAI, Artificial Intelligence Therapy, Freudian or non-Freudian style works by a double-blind study, this does not validate traditional psychotherapy. When you don't know what to do. So I, I, I wish your talk was highly focused on the agency, on but, but what were your concept of research of psychotherapy? It's a very interesting question. And I'm, of course, aware that there are different concepts of psychotherapy. And, and of course, the authenticity or concept of congruence are very important there. I chose to go with the concept of agency because my background is in philosophy. So it was the one reason. But the other reason was that I believe that this is an underlying concept. So when it, no matter which therapist, a psychotherapist is there, it's always a kind of an agent. And it's a moral and rational agent. So I started with this, I would say, underlying and basic concepts to probably also a little bit avoid the complexity of the different psychotherapies because then it would be indeed very difficult to write something about it because it's so complex. But I agree, we don't completely understand how the psychotherapy works. But we, for example, with the cognitive behavioral therapy, there is already a lot of research and the mechanisms are there. So probably this makes sense to put more in the algorithmic fashion. And that's probably also why it works. But still, this underlying concept of moral and rational agency are not fully there. And I think there cannot be there. So that, that was the reason why I decided to, um, to write and, and focus on the agency. Thank you. Um, so maybe just to complete the, the thought. So, so we, we, we're thinking about authenticity. And then uh, there's some writing about alliance and the use of the, of the word alliance in this regard. And uh, some people try to see whether or not alliance is associated with a positive outcome, assuming that there is any expected outcome, usually uh, reducing of some uh, symptoms that people are suffering from. Um, and, and then I think when we talked about whether or not like the original Turing test was whether or not somebody would know that they're talking to a machine. Uh, but I, I think it's really not about that. Uh, we don't want to to pretend that you're talking to a person, uh, I think the question would be, can it evoke similar feelings and similar, uh, let's say, processes, uh, cognitive and emotional and so on, that are uh, maybe uh, useful uh, uh, as, as a regular therapy, maybe even more. So that would be maybe a different kind of Turing test. But um, I think when we talk about alliance, there's a lot of discussion about what that is anyway. But uh, so some talk about agreement about goals. And I said, to you before, I don't think in every therapy there are exam uh, specific goals that people set. Some talk about tasks. Again, that's relevant maybe to certain therapies, but many don't have specific tasks that they uh, provide the patient with. And the one thing that everybody talks about usually is the bond that uh, patient and, and the therapist have. And this could be expressed in many ways. And most of them could be probably imitated by the machine, right? So uh, support and empathy, and you've shown some uh, examples. I guess the, the one that one cannot really, uh, I think, uh, assume that is real is the concept of genuineness. I mean, what does it even mean that it's genuine? I mean, so, you know, uh, when ChatGPT3 became available, I started to consult with it as if I were, um, let's say, having some symptoms as a psychotic patient, but not telling it directly that, letting it see whether or not it catches on my issues and so on. And it was uh, quite surprisingly doing well. Obviously, the level of the language was very good and so on. So it's only relevant for a highly functional psychotic patient, let's say. But it was an interesting uh, experiment for, for me to, to, to think about how, where it could go in the future. Uh, still, you know, I was ex very excited about it, but I did not uh, assume this was uh, genuine. I thought it was very clever in how it could provide me with that. Um, now, I think the last thing to, to discuss is really moral agency, which you mentioned. Now, so I was thinking first, let's suggest the moral concept of how this psychotherapeutic uh, conversational artificial intelligence machine should work because it has to be ethical. Let's think how we adapt ethics to this. This was my initial idea. 
then I realized it might be a too big of idea for me to actually go through with. It's it's a big challenge. So you know, uh, I think first of all, maybe we have to enforce Kai to to adapt to human to human ethics. Maybe it could be smarter than us. Maybe it could reach new concepts of ethics, but we are not able to maybe follow those. So let's settle with human ethics for now, and let's kind of tell Mr. Kai that it's not able to just do what that, that wants, right? So it cannot be ethically autonomous because it might be very dangerous for us, especially when you're talking about mental health. And so I'm thinking it has to be uh, uh, maybe value-based, but also virtues that are very important. It might you know, reflect trustworthiness, so it's not supposed to lie to you maybe and so on. And it's a big question. Um, it's a philosophical question. Is it okay to, to take this potential agent and tell it that it has to abide by human-based ethics as its tool or as its servant, maybe. Maybe it's not a tool, but it, it's serving human beings and therefore it has to apply by its uh, ethics. I would say if you work for me, you work for, for me by my rules, it, it does make sense, even if I'm just your employer and you're a human being, so maybe it's all right. Um, so I think other questions would be if we wanna always have a person in the loop, like a supervisor and so on, uh, is it a supervisor? Is it a co-pilot? Is it a therapist that uses Kai only once in a while between the sessions? What happens when the patient is uh, having kind of relationship with both? Is it like a dyadic? Is it a triadic uh, relationship? Is it like mom and dad and I'm complaining to the computer about the therapist and vice versa? So, uh, you know, these are my very simple minded uh, concepts of, of real life ideas that things that can go wrong and we need to maybe consider uh, if, if that actually happens. Um, so I, I would just say that I'm not sure we should even call it alliance. We may need to have a different name for it, not to confuse the two. And I just want to show the last thing that um, we said, and that's where I really want Michael to suggest his thoughts. So, you know, we said subjectivity and agency are key in psychotherapy. So it's really not so much something to measure by outcome and so on. There's something more there. And so maybe as a tool, it's very beneficial. Uh, it could imitate human agency. But when it does that, it may change what humanity knows as the good life and the healthy life. So, it, I mean, it changes things dramatically. But how does it do that? I'm not so sure. Uh, Michael, being the uh, philosopher here, uh, what do you think about that? Do, does it really change what we understand about humanity? I don't know, because as I told you before, I mean, the, she, Jana hinted to a key paper on the whole topic, this Chinese argument by uh, Sellers. Whether uh, meaning and understanding are relevant and to what extent they are relevant. Now, there is an aspect of the relationship personal relationships are absolutely relevant. But there are some theories of psychotherapy where the therapist is only a facilitator, even Socrates is a midwife. And you just type on the internet, just, I, I tried to do this before the seminar, with this idea about therapists falling asleep during session. Happens quite often. It's considered impolite. For some, they have the chutzpah to argue that it does not, uh, doesn't mean the therapy is bad because it's what you say, what is coming out of you. So the whole notion of psychotherapy that we take it for granted so much is, is, is far from, it's a ritual, it's, it's a social ritual. If we are talking about artificial friend, I think the argument in this presentation would hold this is the right direction because authenticity and friendship certainly are important. But there are elements in psychotherapy that are so much structured like a machine. The session is bounded by time, the payment, the absolute uh, exclusion of personal issues on behalf of the therapist. That's not the tradition that has developed. In this sense, they, it, it moves psych traditional psychotherapy towards something artificial, whatever. <laughs> it's artificial relationship. And then we want this artificial relationship to be 
authentic. It's also important because you tell people. So we have created this uh, social ritual entity that is unique. It's in a way unique to Western medicine, uh, to Western culture. It's not clear. It, it, some people would say it's like witch doctoring. It's a kind of, uh, <laughs> it's not different from herbology or people that read your palm. And if you can design artificial intelligence that read your palm or do as astrology, I don't know. But it, if it works as good as astrology works, that's something. Yeah. So the question is whether the sky is. So we, without, this is why, in a way, I really like, I admire Yana for her task that she took, but it's really highly demanding because it's not ordinary medicine. We don't know how, we don't, under, it's the artificial imitation of something we do not understand. And we have limited consensus about its meaning, its extent, and yeah. how, and whether it works. There's Thank one you. more point that I would throw as a question. There is an issue of habituation. People, when they interact, it's an issue about, well, it's exciting to try a session with a boot. I don't know. It might be exciting for me the first time a uh, customer service. Uh, I, I, when I, I tried customer service and I got a boot. So the first time is fine. The third time, it's annoyance. So it, it, this is something empirical about human psychology to differentiate and to see to what extent there is superficial habituation and also deep habituation. Because as Jana said, AI is always limited to its own resources and they could be endless. But if you think maybe it's too narcissistic that every person has a little different story, a little different personality, uh, not, even if you accumulate all possible knowledge existing in the world, there would be a gap between my personality and all the knowledge or your personality and et cetera, et cetera. I, I prefer the, the, the participants talk because you invite yeah. me the second Thank you. to talk. I get carried away. Uh, all right, Michael, thank but you. But I'm not artificial. I let's open it up. Wait, so let's, so, yeah, so putting me. boundaries is important for humans. Uh, so let's do that. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I would say, though, that if I were a therapist, I would be maybe a bit offended by uh, how you described it. Because, for instance, uh, there is a concept by Freud of uh, attentively listening in a unified manner, flying, like flying kind of attention. So ba basically... You close your eyes, you're almost asleep, but it's really about not paying special attention to one thing that the patient is saying and not another thing, because you don't want to create uh, a kind of biases and so on with uh, the information that is important. So I, I, I wouldn't go there. But anyway, um, let's open it up for a discussion. It, Owen, it was not, it's very short. I am respectful of psychotherapy. We cannot go to any finesse. But at the end, even if the example you pick, is it something I can simulate to or should simulate to? Yeah. We need to know, okay, th that is the message. Yeah, okay, so uh, let's open it up, please. Uh, people, you're invited to open your cameras, so we'll be more uh, feeling like having a group. So any thoughts about any of the issues? There are many um, questions. Yeah. We're giving you time because it will come to you. So, yeah. hello. Yeah, hello. Ellen. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank you. This is very interesting. My background is really epidemiology and data science. I'm not a mental health professional. But as I was listening, I was thinking of, and I'm sorry if I missed some, uh, some of the talking points because I had children in the background. Um, but, uh, it seems to me there's a tremendous potential for patients to report and to deal with and talk out high-risk behaviors that they might be limited in divulging to even a therapist. And it might just become more comfortable for them. Anyway, I'd like the mental health people and the ethicists to really comment about the potential for this 
in therapy with high risk behaviors, suicidality. Thank you. So basically you were focusing on, on high risk patients. Uh, Jana, please. Yeah, thank you very much for this comment. I, for now, I don't focus on the high risk patients, but uh, there is already research showing that some patients are uh, are more willing to disclose information to the chatbots because they feel like this is more confidential because it's actually it's not an other human being. So, so there is no risk that so the chatbot will tell it to someone else, right? But we can also say that this is a little bit also a misconception because this data might be shared with other companies or might be used for other purposes. So there is, of course, important uh, to take care of the ethical, uh, basically ethical data and the privacy issues are very important. Regarding the, the high risk patients, then the algorithms must be developed in a way um, that they can intervene in the case that there is the risk of suicidality. And there are already some algorithms that are quite functional and effective in this. Thank you. Did, did I answer the question? <laughs> yes, yes, sure. thank you. So it might be mentioned that the, the word high risk could allude to different kinds of risks. So it doesn't have to be self-risk. It could be a risk to harming others as well. And then the question is, how do you, like what are the measures for high risk? Um, and when does it uh, lead you to making different uh, uh, actions. It's it's a question for uh, human therapists as well. What do you do and at what point do you report? Do you convince the person to get help and so on? Uh, Amir, I think you have looked at different things that relate to that. You may want to tell us something about this. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, in the, in the past in the past few years, there are, there are a lot of uh, interest in, in this field of um, uh, preventing, uh, identifying, and preventing a relapse in general, and specifically um, different types of uh, behaviors that may be at risk for the individual for the others. And uh, this uh, this line of research, sometimes called uh, digital phenotyping, is trying to. Uh, by using different sensors of the smartphone or other wearables um, to give insights of um, of different behaviors that may be uh, a risk, risky for the individual and others. And the research shows that um, in many ways um, there is potential um, in, uh, for those uh, uh, solutions. Uh, but it's still there is still a lot of uh, of a way to go in, in that sense. Um, what's what seems what's for me is like really interesting in relate in relates to this conversation is to move beyond the AI to the EI, if you if you wish. That is to say, artificial intelligence. We understand that uh, can do a lot of uh, can be really uh, can re can really assist us uh, augment. Uh, the potential of uh, psychotherapy, but to what extent does the machine have the uh, emotional intelligence? And uh, this is, I think, uh, one thing that is uh, very interesting to uh, to explore and to think about. Thank you, Amil. Um, yeah, uh, more questions? Um, yeah, uh, Ellen, your question also relates, I think, to something uh, else that some people wrote about, and that relates to do we think about the type of patients that could be uh, uh, enjoying this kind of technology? Should we uh, say that it's only relevant for certain kind of patients? I alluded to that in a way when I talked about uh, specifically patients in a psychotic state. So maybe for them, uh, conversational AI that may assume conversational capacities and some rationality and so on, uh, is not uh, perfect. But having said that, uh, the capabilities of a computer, let's say, to uh, identify changes of uh, speech patterns, perhaps, or changes or, or maybe slurred speech to make sense of it, or many other things, maybe uh, based on prior events to assume what uh, might happen in the future with the patient, that might be a capacity that in the future will be better than a regular healthcare professional. So in a way, I don't know if it's if it's a good idea to assume that some patients need to be excluded. Um, but, you know, 
uh, there was some report a few days ago that uh, I think a woman was telling that her husband committed suicide after some time getting help with uh, uh, an avatar chatbot uh, for mental health. Now, it might be the case people do that after getting regular mental health support. So, you you know, you don't know if you can assume that there is any correlation. Maybe he was distressed and this was not helpful enough. Maybe a regular help would not have helped him as well. But so we don't really know, you know, it's really, uh, I think over time we'll see more and more uh, that we uh, kind of blame AI for the human shortcomings. We uh, don't know how to solve everything and I'm not sure AI will uh, as well. Um, yeah, any questions, any thoughts? I wish to ask Yana uh, the, your approach to the differentiation between instrument and agency is metaphysical, if it's a metaphysical question. But it might be from a social interactionist perspective, something that is construed by society. If we treat something as an agent, in a typical example, the way certain people interact with their pets or with their dolls. So where, where, did you have thoughts about this line of thinking about the, the more pragmatic social interactionist aspect? Yes, thank you. Thank you for this question. I actually mentioned the, the social response theory, but only very shortly, which I found very fascinating. And this social response theory is also used in, the, in developing these conversational agents. So they use different social cues, verbal or nonverbal cues, so that these agents, the, so that the, the chatbots are perceived as social agents. So definitely it, it is a social construct. Um, but I think that it's still important to ask what this technology actually is, right? Because if we really believe that this is a, an equal partner in a conversation, then there are different consequences also in terms of ethics and normativity. But on the other hand, these metaphysical questions, what is the actual status of conversational AI will not solve the problem. What is the value of the simulation, right? and where we want to go with the simulation. And I'm actually, philosophically speaking, I'm a pragmatist. So I, I like to think about it as a process that it's always embedded in the social values. So also in the terms of philosophy of technology, uh, very often the technology is perceived in the entire socio-technological um, process and context. So I think this is definitely one way how to look at it to look to, at the entire process of the interaction and what is happening all around it. So how the technology is developed, what is the entire narrative in the society? So yes, <laughs> did I answer the question? Yeah, in a way there is discussion for everything. You ask whether Adifus consulting the Oracle, whether the Oracle is an agent or an instrument or whether as long as you don't listen to Oracles, you avoid plenty of trouble. So uh, at least about Adifus, the narrator tells us who was his uh, biological mother and father, but we don't have this objective third person voice of truth that we have in literature. So uh, it's what we, once we entrust ourselves in Kai AI, we might accept the truths or the insights it provides or the direction it leads. As a midwife, it, it elicits from us. It, it's a quite complex an issue. There is something about artificial intelligence about discovery. A typical example is the use for the diagnosis of a skin tumors. So it's, it's, you know there is an answer. It's not easy for the human eye, even a skilled one, so you train a machine. But there is something in artificial intelligence we understand less. It's about creativity. And you want it to create something new. And then it goes, what? 
what what does it mean new? Is ChatGPT creating something new or just to be shuffling the stuff it has? We mentioned it earlier. Then the same with the psychotherapy or with human interaction, or we have the image of human growth. Okay? With the image of human growth, we need something that is new, not just using repeating what we had in the past. But human growth is an image that is highly romantic, highly westernized. Again, if we go to Buddhistic models, you only go back and we live and, and, and dig back into these repeating cycles of existence. Yeah. This is something you can see the model of Atifi. So it requires really broadening the horizons of metaphors we have and the metaphysics we use. And what yeah, we Michael, we have, one more, we have one more question from the audience. Maybe. Um, thank you, Michael. So, sorry. So Demilayer, uh, would you like to present your question? Uh, do you want to share with us? Demilair, uh, I do it. Oh, I'll, I can read the question you sent us if you want. So Demilair is asking the following. Ethically speaking, can AI emote or fill in the gap of moral benchmark needed in the doctor-patient relationship that are naturally covered by humans? Um, Jenna, thoughts on that? Yes. Um... I'm not sure if I understand correctly the question, but uh, I think that this is the problematic point that the AI will be able to fulfill the moral, um, the moral requirements, the order between patients and, and clinicians, because again, the AI doesn't have really virtues. But on the other hand, it would be interesting to think about how to design AI that, had, that would be virtuous. What would be even mean to have a conversational virtuous agent? Yeah. or artificial intelligence. But I, I think this is one of the most problematic points regarding this technology. And again, I, I agree maybe to, to come a little bit back to, to what Michael said. I agree that the narratives in the society are very important and we need, it's actually up on us how we decide what role this technology will have and how we want to use it or interact with it. But in the psychotherapeutic landscape, I think we don't have so much freedom because we are still in the healthcare setting and healthcare have some set of values and virtues. And I think they, they shouldn't be ignored and it should be always placed in this, in this system of values and of values of um, healthcare system. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank, thank you, you Michael. Yeah, I, I would probably just add one thing. I think that uh, you mentioned, you said, yeah. Uh, uh, Oren, yes. yeah. uh, is back. I see him on the screen. Maybe he wants to yeah. talk. Do you want to add something? Have him before. Yeah, Damila, do you want to say something? Please uh, unmute and you're welcome to join us. If we pronounce okay. your thank name correctly. Oh, yes. Uh, Damila, Dami. Dami is fine. I can see that it's difficult. Welcome to our seminar. Uh, thank you. I've been having a great time so far. Um, I'm just curious uh, that, yes, AI development is good for every sector involved. Um, other than concerns, like the question I raised, the ethical aspect of health practice, and um, which well, was we, why I really. Your sound is. You really Damilair, we don't hear you well. Maybe. Uh, you could uh, just uh, un um, take your camera off, but keep the sound. No, keep the sound on. Just turn off your camera. Yeah, keep this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me clearly now? Yeah. Yes, better. Oh, great. So I, I said it, it's it's really a great concern. Um, as much as we appreciate that AI has come to solve so many problems, it's a great concern when it comes to morality emoting like humans and um, connecting with patients in that sense, uh, which was where the question I raised uh, originated from. Another issue that um, I, I want to raise, which is in form of a question, is the issue of um, policies. How do we manage the laws that govern AI in healthcare? Um, do we have universal laws already that cuts across jurisdiction because AI knows no boundary? And our, our, what are we doing in this regard? Thank you. Thank you for this very important question. Um, so um, I, I, maybe I'll just uh, share with you uh, two things. So one is that, uh, as you know, this is our uh, first event 
And our next events are going to be focusing on constructing an ethics framework for AI in biomedical research. That's on May 2nd. Uh, we're going to have one on ethics and governance of AI for health uh, from the WHO, the World Health Organization. Um, so these are the next events. And if you haven't registered to those, then you're, you know, then you're welcome to register and join us. But other than that, there are already several guidelines. Uh, some of them are quite uh, old, I would say, for several years uh, in place that relate to responsible AI or trustworthy AI. So these are, are there. Now you might have heard uh, the talk about let's freeze everything for six months and uh, sit together and whatever. And it relates to uh, maybe this worry that you're mentioning. Uh, there are different groups working on different elements of that. And uh, I, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it more, but it seems that we still need to make sense of other than the general guidelines, maybe we need to be more specific also. It's not just a general normative framework. There are some things here that are potentially different than what we've known before, maybe in magnitude, maybe in other ways. This is really, I think, the biggest challenge here. With our very limited mind, we're trying to consider something that seems to be limitless. I may be exaggerating, but I think that's the biggest challenge here. So these are my thoughts. Yana? Yes, I completely agree. There are definitely some guidelines and also policies regarding the, as you mentioned, the responsible AR, trustworthy AI. This is one that I found very interesting how trust started to be a very important concept. And so it, we can again connect it with the topic if AI uh, can be trustworthy, because usually trust is connected with agents and with humans and with technology. So it's again, very similar question. And again, there are different ways how to go around it and how, how to argue for it. Um, there are also, what is also interesting that a few years ago, um, some of these chatbots or in general mental health apps can be officially approved by the, I believe by the FDA and also in England, in UK. So you can have a list of officially approved mental health apps and among them are also these, these chatbots. I mentioned the robot, for example. So there is robot for um, some specific groups of patients, I don't remember now exactly which ones, but uh, they were actually acknowledged as medical devices. So this is also another thing. So they developed a framework how to how this technology can pass this test of being a medical device. But there what I found interesting is that you can apply for the technology to be acknowledged as a medical uh, device. But then on the other hand, this technology also um, can function as if it was medical uh, device and it still doesn't need an approval or certificate. And I think that this is more dangerous because for example, Bobot or Visa, which is another uh, quite prominent uh, chatbot, they claim that there are only self-care apps. However, the way how they interact, they basically pretend to, to provide patients with psychotherapeutic um, uh, methods. So there, there is the question how to decide if it is a medical device and if it isn't. And there are not enough regulations there. Yeah, thank you, Yana. So you're also touching upon policy and the law. Uh, since we're reaching the end of our uh, session here, um, um, I'd like to thank everyone uh, and uh, invite you all to our next uh, meetings. Yana, that was uh, really a pleasure to hear your thoughts on, on, on the matter. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Amir. Thank you, Thank everyone, you. for participating. And